So we're going to briefly look at Dante's um, literary theory, specifically his uh, letter to his patron, uh, Can Grande della Scala. Um, I think it's probably worth doing, uh, if only because we do teach Dante here, and his, uh, he's the great poet of the Middle Ages. And so it probably deserves some sort of comment, um, although I'm not convinced that uh, his theory necessarily is followed throughout the Middle Ages. Um, still, he's talking about literal and allegorical and so forth. Um, so what he is doing in his uh, letter to Congrani, he writes this to him, by the way, in explicating his uh, um, <coughs> work Paradi to the Paradiso, in particular, of the three canticles. <coughs> and what he does in this is he examines the relationship between general critical principles and uh, how to interpret the specific parts of the text. And he extends what we said last time. And last time I talked about literal and figurative, the different types of literal and figurative, and usually they're applied to scripture. And um, for reasons that we said already, to some degree, uh, because um, uh, heaven and God can't be literally described insofar as he's not an object. And so there's a sense of uh, the use of metaphor in um, even referring to God. It's a, it's a thing that is connoted by these processes. And, and heaven itself is being described in terms that are accommodations to our our language which is predicated on our time and space physical limitations but God of course is not bound to uh, time and space and neither is heaven so um, in a sense a figurative sense of something that is beyond this is is necessary in in Christian thinking and in this period allegorical writing starts to proliferate and it doesn't it's not just of the catholic tradition either we see it in bunyan's pilgrim's Pro progress uh, but we can see it all over the place it's also in in uh, spencer the fairy queen allegorical um, writing and some of the most famous uh, writing actually as i say in the protestant tradition has that uh, allegorical sense so it is not I can't ignore it. Um, so we're, I'm glad that we've done something of this, but he is describing and extending to vernacular poetry the four senses of allegorical interpretation I talked about last time. So there's the literal, there is the allegorical, the moral, and finally the anagogical. And those four senses, uh, he's simply um, taking from um, theological context from applications to scripture and now is applying them also to vernacular writing like his own. And what's one of the things that's interesting about Dante is that he is writing in the vernacular. He's writing in Italian. He's not writing in Latin, which is the lit language of the literate. He is writing it in uh, the common speech of his people. So if you want to blame the Reformation on somebody, maybe you want to blame Dante because he's already appealing to the audience and writing it in their language. I, I didn't mean that entirely. Uh, uh, it was a bit tongue in cheek that. Um, but there is a sense of uh, uh, the four senses of scripture here are not four senses properly, but rather one which evokes the other three. So the, the three figurative senses are entailed in the literal account. So you should be reading it on multiple levels is what he means. And, and that will uh, give rise to the term that critics will use, that it will, it will be polysemous. Semus here from the words that we, same root that, from which we derive semantics, the meaning. It has many meanings. Poly means many, semus meanings. It has many meanings. You can read it on multiple levels. But there, there, so when you uh, explicate, 
you don't do it in a wooden dogmatic sense of say, okay, so here, you know, so here's the literal sense, and now let's find the other three senses. No, you, you ha there's a sense that you ought to be reading it applied. Remember, this is the, in, in the Commedia, we have Dante the Pilgrim going through this journey, but of course, his journey will also apply to every Christian, in a sense. And there's a moral component and there's a sense of the anagogical in the sense of the whole of the Divine Comedy is leading us to the vision, the beatific vision of God at the end of it. The Trinity is seen at the end. So it, it's anagogical in the sense that every person undergoes the same pilgrimage in life that Augustine described back in the work we looked at earlier uh, on Christian doctrine. And it follows that same trajectory. It's ordered by love, Dante's Commedia. So we don't, uh, uh, we, we, read, we don't read in each episode a need to find uh, three other senses besides the literal. But so let, let me just read what I've taken the extract from this levels of interpretation here. Oops, that was a mistake. I say that this exposition should be literal and allegorical. And to understand this one, this, this, one should know that writings may be understood and should be explained chiefly according to four senses. The first is called literal, and this is what, that which does not extend beyond the letter of the fictitious words, as in the fables of the poets. The second is called allegorical, and this is that which hides beneath the mantle of these fables and is a truth concealed beneath a beautiful lie. Note that he is now a beautiful lie. And, and, and I said last time, or last time, two times ago, when we talked about Sidney and his defense of poetry, he's, he's not saying that poetry expresses truth. It's a beautiful lie, or as Lewis calls, lives breathed through silver in his, uh, um, what's it, Mythopoeia. Um, uh, Tolkien responding to Lewis, must, he must have said something like this. It's not purporting to be true in the sense of recording a literal event. That's what's meant there. But it does have some sort of truth in its allegorical representation. Whereas in, in Christian scriptures, again, it is recounting a historical event that has the manifold significance of the polysemousness of Dan, Dante's text. Because of, because of, of course, Christ the man is also God and it does have a th everything he does as a theological consequence. And that's plain from reading the text as well. So, for example, Ovid says that Orpheus made the wild beast gentle with his lute and caused the trees and stones to move themselves. It's obviously a fable. It's, there's no figure that we know called Orpheus, but Orpheus is a figure referred to in poetry by many poets, later poets as well. He becomes in the, in the Middle Ages, there are poems about Orpheus going down to the underworld and taming the wild beasts, etc. Um, <laughs> this is as much to say that a wise man with the instrument of his voice may make cruel hearts gentle and humble and cause those who have not the life of knowledge and art to move according to his will. So he applies the story of Orpheus to uh, the effect of um, good art. He moves people who are inert and you could say that actually this is the understanding of what the gospel does as well, actually. Um, because the, the, the English word gospel, which gets translated from the uh, Greek evangelion, the good news, the God spell, the news there, this, the, the news there, this word spell in uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, is picked up in English and one of the connotations has been lost, namely a story, but another has been retained, namely the magic. We talk about a spell, an incantation. Yes, but the God spell has, the, has a peculiar efficacy that it translates sinners into saints. It brings people into the kingdom of God. There's something in this story which is also quasi-magical. It, it has a particular efficacy because it's a pneumatic text like we last, last we talked about last time. <clears throat> and 
Dante here is talking about <clears throat> here in the in the story of Ovid that we can also read it allegorically to, to talk about the poetic vocation in general and art has the capacity to do this to move people who are inert so those who do not have any reasonable life when he means reasonable life here he's talking about who have faith in Christ because he defines human nature as a individual substance of a rational nature he's following Boethius here so to have a reasonable life uh, in the um, inferno Dante it's actually Virgil that explains it but says that they've lost the good of the intellect the people who are in hell they've lost the good of the intellect they're irrational because the good of the intellect is God and they haven't through their vain darkened minds have ignored that God exists and that they ought to obey him and follow him so in that sense those who do not have any reasonable life are as stones again the gospel there are stones truly the theologians take this sense otherwise than do the poets but because my intention is to follow the poets I take the allegorical sense as the poets use it so he doesn't want to claim the same efficacy in vernacular texts as we see in sacred writ it doesn't actually have the power of salvation Nonetheless, he thinks it has some, uh, there is something to be said for uh, entailing in the literal also figurative meanings, and even those figurative meanings can be referring to the kingdom of heaven, which is referred to in scripture and is referred to by Dante himself in his Paradiso. The third sense is moral, and this is that which readers should watch for intently in writings for their own utility and for that of their descendants. For example, one can find it in the Gospel. When Christ, ascending the mountain for the transfiguration, took only three of the twelve apostles with him, one may understand that in the most secret matters we should have little company. That would be a moral application. It's not one that most people would, in reading the text, um, no, no, preacher that I've ever heard talks about that dimension. But it is the case that not all the disciples come forward with him. Only a few. And so that might be the moral lesson that could be drawn from that passage because it's very peculiar. Why are all the disciples not called forth to observe uh, the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah, it's good to be here, Jesus. And he just tells them to be quiet. Because <laughs> I think fr from that we ensue, I, we were to infer that he's misunderstood what's going on here. Um, and the nature of the misunderstanding is not even presented to us, but it's a misunderstanding. So you just be quiet and watch and listen. The fourth sense is called anagogical or supernatural. And this appears when a writing, which is true, even in the literal sense, is explained spiritually and by the things signified refers to the supreme things of eternal glory. So if we go back to what we said in Augustine, it's about the journey and yet the journey and the end of the journey has a supernatural significance just like Lewis's Narnia. When we talk about the Chronicles of Narnia, he's actually talking not only about a invented world where Aslan reigns and where there are, they are kings and queens of Narnia, but he's talking about a heavenly spiritual reality which one day they will be translated into when they die, in that sense. But that's just my contemporary application, but that's what he means here. For example, one may say to see the sense in the Song of the Prophet, who said that in the exodus of the people of Israel from Egypt, Judea is made holy and free. Psalm 113, verse 1. That this happens to be true, according to the letter, is manifest. And no less true is that which is understood spiritually, that is, that in the exodus of the Spirit from sin, the Spirit is made holy and free in its own power. And in demonstrating these senses, the literal should always come first. This is a repeated emphasis. You will not find any deviation from this by a significant a Christian commentator throughout the whole Middle Ages. But there are those that we're not reading that are actually um, suggesting otherwise. Let's go to the spiritual meaning, because that's where Christians need to look, because we're spiritual beings. Let's focus on the spiritual, not on the literal. But all of the 
significant commentators, at least the ones I'm going to cite, are going to insist that the literal is always the ground for the figurative. It should always come first, as the one in whose sentence the others are included. Note that they're included in it. It's not on top of it. The, the, there's a latent figurative meaning there which you can tease out. And without it, which it would be impossible and irrational to understand the others, especially the allegorical. So when somebody says that's a figure of speech, I, my question is, well, what's a, a figure of speech of? What's it a figure for? Um, anyway, it is, lit it is impossible because in anything which has an outside, inside and an outside, it is impossible to come to the inside without first coming to the outside. So that, as I say, the, the, the allegorical, the moral, the anagogical is actually hidden underneath the literal, and you can't access it without coming to the literal. That idea of inside and outside is rather helpful. Um, I think I'm going to skip down on this. Um, and I'll just leave it to you to look at this afterwards, this excerpt here, which I put included in the class uh, notes on the web page here. Um, I think it's rather helpful. Um, let me come to, actually that's not what I wanted to do it. I don't want Irenaeus, Chrysostom, John of Salisbury, Aquinas. No, I want Hugh of St. Victor just saying the same thing. Sorry, let me erase that here. Just to reiterate, although Thomas did exactly the same thing in the extract I copied there. They say we read the scripture, but we do not read the letter. We do not care about the letter. We teach allegory so this to his critics. But how do you read scripture without reading the letter? For if you say, because they, they, they'll quote scripture and say, but the letter killeth and the spirit gives life, we are interested in only life, so we are interested in the spiritual reading. It's an it's a, it's a exegetical form of Gnosticism, really. For if you take away the letter, what is scripture? We, they reply, read the letter, but not according to the letter. For we read allegory and we expound the letter, uh, not according to the letter, but according to allegory. But what is it to expound the letter without pointing out what the letter signifies? As long as you remain ignorant of the letter, you do not go around boasting about your understanding of Scripture. For to be ignorant of the letter, uh, of uh, of the letter as to be unaware of what the letter signifies and of what is signified by the letter. I think I need to pull this down because I am... This is the problem with this. Or I'll just shrink it. Maybe that will just solve the problem for me. And now I need to... Pardon me. For that which is signified by the first, i.e. the letter, signifies still a third thing. Since, therefore, those things which the letter signifies are signs for spiritual understanding, how can they be this kind of signs for you when they are not yet signified to you? So first they have to be a sign before this, the thing signified comes forward. First, always. And yet they're moving immediately to what's signified by that. Now this justification could be used as a means of reinterpreting scripture then and suggesting that the spirit is more authoritative than the word. And this is part of what inf uh, pushes Luther towards the blank around the text, the glossa ordinaria, is to get rid of that. Now it's not to say that the tradition is wholly in this direction because it's clearly not. But again, remember, he's a university professor, and he's just saying, let's, let's look at where we derive all our meaning, and that all that meaning comes from, the, from reading scripture. It is authoritative. And the other authorities are lesser authorities. Nonetheless, they are authorities, but they're, they're lesser authorities. They, their authority, however, is always normed by scripture. We need to say, what, what's the literal meaning? And he keeps going to that when he's uh, challenged 
by the theologians in the magisterium of the day. Yes, but what does the what does scripture say? Anyway, 